We welcome you to Urban United Methodist Church, and we are pleased that you are worshiping here with us today. Thank you to Willie and Kay Dorman for the beautiful altar flowers given to the honor and glory of God. Our announcements for this week, the youth will meet here at Urban UMC this afternoon from 4 to 5.30 in the Family Life Center, and then the youth band will practice from 5.30 to 6.30 in the sanctuary. The in-house small group will meet tonight at 7. Our weekly Tuesday devotion will be posted Tuesday morning. The weekly Bible study will be held on Wednesday night at 7 here in the sanctuary. Our weekly Thursday devotion will be posted Thursday morning. And then truck, truck or treat will be on Halloween night in our main parking lot from 6 to 8 p.m. It's not too late to sign up to volunteer to decorate a vehicle and pass out candy. Please let Jennifer, Gina, or Deanna know if you would like to volunteer to help. Please remember to wear your masks and practice safe social distancing at all meetings this week. Coming up next week, Daylight Savings Time ends next Sunday, November 1st. Remember to set your clocks back one hour and enjoy that extra hour of sleep. All Saints Sunday will be next Sunday, November the 1st. We will remember all our saints who have passed away during the past year during those services. The youth will meet next Sunday, November 1st at Coach United Methodist Church from 4 to 5.30. The Ministries Planning Team, which was formerly the Council on Ministries, will meet next Sunday, November 1st at 5 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And then the Staff Parish Relations Committee will meet next Sunday, Sunday, November 1st at 6 in the Family Life Center. The Administrative Board will meet next Monday, November 2nd at 7 in the Family Life Center. And then the United Methodist Women will have a general meeting next Tuesday, November the 3rd at 7 o'clock in the Family Life Center. So it's going to be a busy weekend and week next week. Are there any other announcements that need to be shared this morning? All right, well, now please stand if able as we recite our mission statement. The mission of the Urban United Methodist Church is to love God, love one another, and make disciples for Jesus Christ by welcoming, worshiping, and witnessing. Please remain standing for the invocation. Our invocation today is based on Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep God's and who seek God with their whole heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me an understanding, that I may keep your law and preserve it with my whole heart. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I will keep your law continually, forever and ever. Please remain standing at able as we sing our call to worship hymn, hymn number 657, This is the Day.
believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Our words can cut like a knife. 
they can hurt others. Um, we all know that God hears every word that we say, and he knows every thought that we have in our mind. It's very important for us to be careful about the things we think and not the, the things that we say. The Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Once we have said it, we can't take it back. So let's make sure that our words are nice and pleasing to God. Now we're going to say a prayer. Dear Lord, help us to let every word we speak be pleasing in your sight. Let no words come from our mouths that would be hurtful to others. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now we will sing verses 1 and 2 of our hymn of prayer, number 420, Breathe on me, Breath of God. Thank you. 
In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is the Old Testament reading. Now let's turn our attention to today's New Testament lesson, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the discernment of spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This ends the New Testament lesson. If able, please stand for the Gospel lesson. Today's Gospel lesson comes from John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. This is the word of God for us and the people of God. Thanks be to God. The congregation may be seated. This morning I'm going to talk a bit about words, our words, especially God's word. Before I do that, I want to share a word, and that is it was seven months ago that I took a, a pretty bad fall and uh, fell about 12 feet and landed face down on cement. And uh, within an hour of that happening, I was in intensive care at Lillington, and so was uh, Pastor Don there with us as well as our son. And after a very expensive helicopter ride up north to a hospital somewhere, I spent three days in intensive care. Anyway, in the midst of all that, I'm glad to be able to, I'm glad to, be, able to be standing and talking, and I'm also very thankful for all that you and this church did for me and for us. I thank you for your visits, your words, your cards, and your prayers. Second thing is, is that uh, my goodness, a couple of weeks ago on the uh, Laity uh, Recognition uh, Award, uh, I had no idea that you would be uh, thinking of us, but again, I thank you for those of you who did, and it was a, quite a humbling honor. And so again, I say thanks. For my message this morning, I'm going to start out with a question. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But how much is a word worth? If you were to pay somebody to give you a good word, what word would you hope for, and how much would you pay? Well, back when Rudyard Kipling was uh, England's most popular writer, which was back in the 1890s, because Kipling, he was quite a writer of poems and stories, short stories, and then books. In fact, he wrote Jungle Book in 1894 and Jungle Book number two in 1895. And in 1907, he was given a Nobel Prize in literature for his writing. Anyway, it became known somehow, word got out, that his publishers were paying him a dollar a word for anything that was put into print. And a dollar a word back then to some people, it sounded like pretty easy money. 
to some people, way too much money. Because back then, a common laborer could be shoveling coal all day or chopping wood all day and maybe get 80 cents. Not everybody was getting a dollar a day in the 1890s. And here he was getting a dollar a word for everything that was put in print. So some smart aleck Cambridge College students, upon hearing this, they scraped together their dimes and their nickels, and they wired Kipling a dollar, along with the instructions, please send us one of your very best words. And he did. He replied back with a one-word telegram, thanks. <laughs> the word thanks is indeed one of our very best words. It's good for the person who speaks it, not to mention how good it is for the person who hears it. And Solomon in Proverbs 25, 11 expressed it well. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Thanks is indeed a, a very fitly spoken word, and it's too bad we don't hear ourselves say it more often. So I was curious to know in the English language, just how many words do we have to choose from? Do you have any idea how many words there are in the ultimate dictionary for the English language? Well, think of a big number and then double it. The second edition of the 20 volume Oxford English Dictionary, it contains full entries for over 171,000 words. And those are words that are in current use but it also includes over 47,000 obsolete words. And so if you add all this together, it would make over 218,632 words. So I was curious, well, how does English compare to German, French, or Spanish, or Chinese? Uh, one source said that uh, the Germans had eight times more words than we do. So what does that mean? Anyway, 218,000 words in English. How would you like to study for that spelling test? In fact, uh, I wonder what would happen if uh, all of you who are teachers, either at home or in a classroom, were to tell your kids tomorrow to start boning up for a little bit of a spelling test you're going to have on Friday. And if you do that, uh, tell me how that goes. So we read in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in Genesis we read, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. So the first word to ever exist was God. And the first words God spoke were, let there be light. And today, one of the best words we can hear or say is thanks. I just want you to know how captured I am by the power of the spoken word. The power of a spoken word, it can be very healing and helping. And as was mentioned in the children's message this morning, spoken words can also be very hurting and haunting. And the haunting, I know. That terrible morning when Peter denied knowing Christ, not just once or twice, but three times. This was before the rooster was even fully awake. I wonder if Peter ever wished he could unsay some of his spoken words. And yet trying to unsay something is as futile as trying to unsee or unhear something. You know, the delete button on our computers makes life seem so unfair. And before the computer, of course, we had VCRs. And VCRs, there was that wonderful reverse button where you could back the tape up and erase it or tape over it. I mean, you could back the tape up and poof, it no longer exists. Of course, some of us remember an even older technology, the magic slate with that little red wooden pencil where you just sort of lift up the cover sheet and it all goes away. Well, it's amazing how even though technology changes, some things remain the same. It can be very cleansing to erase the things we see on a screen, be it the TV or a computer. It's harder to erase things from our minds 
and from our actual history. I want to go back to God's first spoken words about light. And of course, we know he's referring to the sun. And is there anything more powerful in the universe than the sun? And how again did all this happen? It would have been appropriate, if not expected, for God to say, I demand for there to be light. I insist for there to be light. And haven't we all had bosses with a bit of a God complex who thought their every word was law? But here we have God, who is God, simply saying, let there be. Gentle, simple, soft-spoken words. And so the thought came to me, this most powerful thing in the universe wasn't locked inside of a, a massive vault. It wasn't hiding behind some huge, huge door. But maybe it was more like behind a curtain. But a curtain that only God could open. The first gift God gave to the world was light, and it was good. And oh, for the power of God's spoken word. But in putting all this together, I remember that sometimes there's a lot of power in unspoken words. Like when you see in another person's eyes the essence of their heart. We all know how it is that sometimes people say things more with their eyes than they do their mouth. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but sometimes a word is worth a thousand pictures. Take, for example, the word love. And think of all the wedding pictures, baby pictures, and Christmas pictures where love is the essence of what was captured on film. To experience the essence of another person's heart in a treasured moment of silence, how powerful is that? When Jesus was trudging his way through the streets, carrying his cross, which our Catholic friends uh, refer to as the way of the cross, and to them, they even have the stations of the cross. And in Spanish, it's referred to as the Via Dolorosa. Anyway, as Jesus was on that painful journey, we can only imagine how terrible it was. And things were not going well. And sometimes he stumbled a couple of times. Individuals from the crowd actually intervened. Matthew 27, verse 32, it tells how at one point the soldiers picked a man out of the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, and they essentially said, hey, you there, get over here and pick this up. And of course he did. Why do you suppose and how do you suppose that the soldiers picked on him? I can't imagine that there was anything unusual about Simon and what he might have been wearing that day, or what he might have been holding that day. The scriptures, of course, don't tell us a lot, but I truly, truly doubt that he was the only one on the street that day in a purple hat holding a peacock. But something caused them to look at him. Now, maybe it was a random coincidence, or maybe what caught the soldiers' attention was the look they saw in Simon of Cyrene's eyes. In his eyes, they could see the essence of his heart. And in his heart, he was probably already trying to do what he could to help Christ lift his heavy burden. And then in being commanded to actually do so, it was probably a relief. The first gift God gave to the world was light, and it was good. The way it all happened was quite simple. What about the gifts God gives us? Have you ever had a Sunday school lesson on the gifts of the Spirit or the fruits of the Spirit? Interesting how just a couple of weeks ago, Brother Beasley, when he, in his talk about Laity Sunday, mentioned specifically the fruits of the Spirit and how it is now coming up, we all have an opportunity to take online a study on the gifts fruits of the Spirit. Years ago, I enrolled in a little Bible study workshop thing one time, 
The main focus was to see what the Bible has to say about discovering our spiritual gifts. And as I went into that first session, I figured, well, we'd probably hit all the highlights in about 20 minutes, and I was starting to worry about what we'd be talking about the rest of the hour. And oh my goodness, was I ever wrong. It was a fascinating study. And four sessions later, when we ended, really we were just getting started. Some Christians, when trying to talk with them about <clears throat> the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit, they're quick to tell you that I don't have any. As if to say, God hasn't touched me yet. But in truth, we all have some. In our last church, Gail tried uh, covering this with the, uh, the women's group and led a, a study for a little while. And in the, our class was this uh, fine, fine lady. She's a pillar of the church, pillar of the community, the backbone of her family. Bless her heart, she had a terrible childhood. Her dad died when she was a toddler. Yet in the midst of all this, she was such a joy to know. And they tried to help her see what others saw in her as being her spiritual gifts. And she was adamant that she didn't have any. And the more you tried to point out to her, the harder she pulled against the rope. Some people would say that she was just plain stubborn, but since it was her and we all loved her, I guess we'd just say she was really steadfast. In discovering our gifts, we sometimes think that we have to climb a mountain, swim an ocean, fight our way through a desert or a jungle, or we're finally faced with a very thick and heavy door that's too hard to open. But what if this magical door isn't really something that's way over there. Well, what if it's something that's right here? And what if this door really isn't a door at all? What if it's merely a curtain? And all we have to do is ask God for a little guidance to simply push it aside and open it just a little bit. Remember how just a few weeks ago, Preacher Juan pointed out in some detail how it is that sometimes we don't get the things we want or that we need or expect to have because we don't ask. How many times do you say you have to ask? Another thing that gets in our way is sometimes our biggest fault is we go out of our way to make things more complicated and more difficult than it is. Somebody asks us for the time of the day, what do we do? We try building them a watch. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul gives some detailed advice about God-given spiritual gifts. And they're all listed right there. There's nine of them. And then a, a little bit later in Galatians chapter 5, he ident identifies nine fruits of the Spirit. And just like that, from God's holy word, we have 18 more powerful words. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, faith, love, joy, and peace. And the list goes on and on. God gave us light, and he saw that it was good. And as with all God's gifts, we are to use them wisely. There's an old fable that tells the story of a man who was coming home one night, and as he was cutting through the park, he noticed uh, underneath a lamppost there was a man busily studying the ground. When asked what he was doing, the man said, well, I've lost my watch. And so both of them, on hands and knees, searched fruitlessly for quite some time. And finally, the guy who stopped to help, he said, that watch is not here. Tell me again everything. Exactly where did you lose it? And he said, oh, over there. And he pointed to a dark shadow about 20 feet away. So exasperated, the guy said, well, if you lost it over there, why are you looking for it over here? The man answered, well, duh, this is where the light is. <laughs> a 
What a powerful story and what a dumb story. And unfortunately, it describes the truth of things we sometimes do today. God gave us light, and as with all his gifts, we're to use them wisely, and when we do, our problem-solving skills can only improve. And so there's power in spoken words, power in unspoken words, and I'd be amiss if I didn't mention something about the power of the printed word. I don't know how many of you caught that special about a week ago on public TV about the printing press. Now, many think that the printing press was the number one invention that sparked the Industrial Revolution. Oh, for the power of the printed word. How many of you have read a very good book, a very good book, which then, lo and behold, a few years later, was made into a movie. And of all the people that I've talked to who have both read the book and seen the movie, when asked, well, which one did you enjoy the most? By and large, most people prefer the book. <clears throat> it's amazing how a $5 or a $10 book can outshine a full-length color film that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce. One source says that the average, average cost of a full-length feature film is 65 million. And now I'll look at the power of God's printed word, the Holy Bible. In closing, I want to tell you a true story about Dr. William P. Mackey. It took him quite a while to discover his spiritual gifts. Back in the early 1800s in Scotland, William, he, at the age of 17, left home to attend college. His godly mother was helping him pack his things, and he, she made sure that in his things was a Bible. She packed him a special Bible in which she wrote his name, her name, and a verse of Scripture, and off he went. Officially, his declared major was medicine. But in truth, he mostly majored in whiskey. In no time at all, he strayed far beyond the path of, way, of the way he had been raised. And at one low point, he even pawned his Bible to help satisfy his thirst, the very Bible that his mother had given him. Fast forward about 15 years or so. Later, miraculously, William Mackey was now Dr. William Mackey. He was the leading doctor in the largest hospital in Edinburgh. And one day he was making his rounds. He was at the bedside of a dying patient. There was a laborer who had been seriously injured, and for certain the man was dying. And from his bed the man called out, Bring me my book. I need my, yeah, I need my book. Would somebody please bring me my book? Those spoken words seemed to echo in Dr. Mackey's soul. A short time later, the doctor was told that the patient had indeed died. And he asked, did anybody ever get that guy his book? And what kind of book was it anyway? Was it his bank book? Was it his address book? Was it his date book? And the nurse said, well, it's under his pillow. Go see for yourself. Reaching under the pillow, he found a Bible, but not just any Bible. Inside the cover in his mother's hand was his own name, his mother's name, and the verse of scripture she had written. Someone obtained the Bible from the pawn shop and had become a priceless treasure to a dying man. Mackey took it to his office, closed the door, and for several hours began reading it, essentially for the first time. <clears throat> it changed his life. You see, in addition to his being the head doctor, in town, he was also president of an atheist society. Well, he went back to school to become a minister, and as a new Presbyterian pastor, he also discovered that he had a bit of a knack for writing songs. He wrote several hymns, and one of his most popular hymns is entitled Revive Us Again. It turns out it was one of Billy Graham's favorites, and that Billy would use it nearly every night in his crusades. 
You might not recognize the hymn from the title, but you might remember this from the chorus, <clears throat> which goes something like this. Alleluia, find the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, find the glory. Revive us again. One thing that made this hymn so powerful was the way Billy Graham used it in the congregation to sing it. You see, in a packed stadium of 60,000 people, he'd have 30,000 over 30,000 of them on one side sing the hallelujah part, while the 30,000 on the other side would answer him back with thine the glory. And so the congregation would sing responsibly this side, that side, this side, that side. A very powerful, worshipful moment. Well, may the power of God's word, however, however it finds you, bring light to your life, and indeed, may it revive us again. And amen. amen. Let's stand and sing a closing hymn close to the end.